welcome you all to what is our third roundtable discussion in our series on social medicine for our times, um, which is a partnership between the Center for Social Medicine here at Berkeley and California Nurses Association and National Nurses United, where we've really designed a, a palette of discussions for us to engage in a critical dialogue between scholars, activists, and health practitioners to assess and take proactive steps toward collectively redressing root causes of health, social, economic disparity, and injustice. So my name is Heidi Hakes, and I serve as a one of the lead educators at National Nurses United. Um, for those of you who are not aware of our organization, um, we are the largest union of registered nurses, labor union of registered nurses in US history. In California, we have 86,000 members. Um, National Nurses United as a whole has 150,000 members, and we work um, in solidarity with nurses unions around the world through our affiliations in, with Global Nurses United as well as through our direct disaster relief um, program um, where we go to sites that are, are hit by climate crisis um, through our registered nurse response network. Uh, the center of our organizing um, and solidarity work is to protect the health and well-being of all people and to act <coughs> as patient advocates both at the bedside but also to heal the root causes of health injustice at local, national, and global scales. And we do this through robust educational efforts but also by leading the campaign for universal health care in this country, by attempting to curb the power and influence of financial interests by taxing Wall Street with a Robin Hood tax, and by working in support and solidarity of social movements that are addressing the root causes of, of health disparity, including, including fair housing, environmental justice, water protection, um, movements against racism and state violence and, and political repression, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's so exciting for us to be partnering with uh, the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine, who shares our interest in causes and healing incredible health disparities. Now, I want to talk just briefly about what we have learned from decades of fighting for health injustice in, in this organization. Um, one is that divide and conquer strategies have been used against every movement for, for change, and that pleas for unity and solidarity that don't effectively address structural and institutional barriers to justice, or that wrongly target the sources of our differential suffering, too often play directly into the hands of oppression. The second thing we've learned as a labor union and a labor organization, or organization that it is that in these times we cannot afford to relinquish the rights that we have earned through our collective struggles for working people to collectively bargain, organize, and demand safe, equitable, and just work sites um, that we have won historically. But neither can we hoard the social and health benefits of those historical victories for a select few at the expense of the many who have been excluded by half-measured and racist health pol uh, workplace policies. So without a clear and honest assessment of how sorry, you translation. Can you please slow down so the interpreters can Yeah, sorry about clearly. that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get us out on target because I know we've got a really exciting conversation ahead of us. Um, and I also just always speak really quickly. Um, <laughs> so uh, what we, we know is that without a clear and honest assessment of how the history of colonization, racism, imperialism, economic and environmental violence are embedded into systems and social structures, and without collectively thinking and working together across our movements to research and end unnecessary suffering for all people, our demands for social transformation risk reproducing uh, the very problems that we are attempting to resolve. So I'm so excited today to introduce a highly esteemed panel of, of, of scholars, activists, thinkers who are really going to help guide us to address some of the deep um, historical challenges that we face today. Uh, George Lipsitz is a professor in the Department of Black Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the author of many, many, many incredibly important books. Um, in addition to teaching me almost everything that I know about what it means to be a principled scholar who is deeply engaged with a, a rich historical analysis of the challenges we face and the movement commitment to ending those challenges in the long and beautiful struggle for justice um, in this country. George is a leading scholar in social movements, urban culture, inequality, the politics of popular culture, um, and, and um, is, is really just a anchor of social justice and what it can mean to, to think critically and apply that thinking 
to make actual and meaningful change by connecting our movements in deep and in sustained ways. Um, just a few of his many path-breaking books include The Possessive Investment in Whiteness, How Racism Takes Place, A Life in the Struggle, Time Passages, American Studies in a Moment of Danger. I could just keep reading all of the books on my bookshelf, but I, I, I just suggest read them all. Um, in addition to a number of grassroots formations for um, racial and economic justice, Lipsis serves as chairman of the board of directors of the African American Policy Forum and as a member of the board of directors of the National Fair Housing Alliance. We also have the delight of, of having Rupa Mara here with us today. Um, Rupa is a doctor, as a, an associate professor of medicine within the division of hospital medicine at UCSF. Her interests center around the intersection of society and illness, focusing her research on how social structures may predispose different disadvantaged <coughs> groups to certain illnesses. She's a faculty director of the Do No Harm Coalition, which is a 450 plus member strong group of health workers and students dedicated to ending racism and state violence. In partnership with Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle, Dr. Linda Black Elk, and Mass Design Group, she's currently helping to set up a uh, um, Mean Mikoni Health Clinic at Standing Rock at the invitation of Lakota and Dakota health leaders to create a space for the practice of decolonized medicine. Since residency at UCSF, she has been the composer and front woman for the international touring group Rupa and the April Fishes, a project that uses music as a way to explore the personal and political aspects of unrest. Next to Rupa, we have Carlos Martinez, who is a Ford Foundation pre-doctoral fellow and second year PhD student in the joint program in medical anthropology at UC Berkeley and UCSF. Prior to beginning the PhD program, he received a master's degree in public health at San Francisco State University. Carlos has all been engaged with a diverse array of programs and advocacy efforts aimed at challenging racial, economic, and health inequalities in the United States and abroad. His research explores the intersections between medicine, biocitizenship, global capitalism, post-coloniality, and structural vulnerability in the United States and Latin America. Between 2008 and 2010, Carlos uh, conducted research on grassroots social movements in Venezuela, which culminated in a book, Venezuela Speaks, Voices from the Grassroots. And last but not least, we have our discussion moderating, uh, being moderated tonight by the esteemed Charles Briggs, who is a Berkeley anthropology professor um, and Berkeley Center for Social Medicine co-director. Charles Briggs himself is a well-recognized expert in the area of racial and health justice, and I will turn the floor over to him and invite you all to thank me and, and help me thank the panel for being here today. <laughs> My role is simply to invite our three speakers to see if they would honor us with a few initial remarks, um, which are meant simply to sort of get the conversation going, and then we'll, um, first of all, um, I will move oh. over. I think he wants you to move on this side. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay with me. me. My friend CB, he actually runs the event because, you know, <laughs> uh, the virtual presence is crucial. So I'll... Uh, uh, be a dutiful subject and move over to this side. Thanks, Scott. Yep. So, again, we, uh, um, I was going to start on that side, um, um, but maybe in the end, since I've been pushed to the left, it was really hard, but uh, um, perhaps then we might just uh, begin with George, if you would um, please start us off. Yeah, well, good evening and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, a half century ago, Ray Charles recorded a Percy Mayfield song called The Danger Zone. And the lyrics go, the, the world is in an uproar and the danger zone is everywhere. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately as we witness the systemic disintegration of major institutions in our society. We're at a moment, uh, a turning point from which there's no turning back. That the problems that we see in the environment, the economy, the educational system, the electoral system, uh, warfare unrestrained around the world, and of course the uh, cruel, calculated, cruel, organized abandonment of the health and well-being of uh, most of the citizens of the planet commands our attention. We're increasingly forced to live in a society where a few people who are considered exceptional uh, call the tune, and the large masses of people considered disposable are, s 
are supposed to be simply uh, spectators and witnesses to their own destruction. And so co we're called upon at this moment um, to be something we haven't been before. We may not yet be the people we need to be to respond to this moment, but we need degrees of clarity, courage, and conviction that can't be wished into existence. They have to be produced by practices and processes, by organizing, by uh, mobilizing, uh, by educating and agitating. The practical work that we do is going to play a role in the, the future that we either uh, have or, or don't have. And it's very important to, uh, at this moment, uh, when nobody is going to do for us what we fail to do for ourselves, to create a kind of new social charter. We have to reckon with the ways in which, yes, a small group runs the world and a large group is disadvantaged by that, but that large group has many differences that can't be papered over, that can't be ignored. Uh, we simply can't imagine a solidarity based only on sameness because we have too many identities. There isn't one way to be a worker. There isn't one way to be a woman. There isn't one way to be transgender. There isn't one way to be undocumented. And yet we have to look out for each other, find a way to work together. I often say we need to put ourselves in shape to meet the challenges that we're going to be facing. Now, I know a room full of nurses probably knows more about what it means to be in shape than I do. Uh, the <laughs> basketball player, Charles Barkley, used to resent it when his teammates said he wasn't in shape because, as Barkley explained it, round was also a shape. <laughs> uh, but for us, shape means being prepared uh, to stand up, to step up, to speak up, to talk to your neighbor who doesn't speak to you, uh, to go out each day, every day, each year, every year, until, uh, 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 until we can look at each other uh, with, uh, with mutual respect and, and decency. I want to say one more thing about these differences as perhaps a, a way of thinking about how we might uh, work together. And then I have some specific things from labor history that I would like to talk about uh, later on in the panel. Uh, the thing that strikes me immediately are the words of uh, uh, the great martyred Archbishop Oscar Romero, shot to death shortly after preaching mass in San Salvador in 1980 who for 57 years of his life was a cleric who basically served the rich and enjoyed the flattery of the rich. And the last three years of his life, a crisis, a disintegration of his society, compelled him to walk with the poor, to spend his life as Dr. King and others have done in the consciously chosen company of the poor and to see their uh, destiny as wrapped up with his. And Romero said, this is not an easy thing to do. If you have a roof over your head and meat and bread on your table, uh, you don't really know what it's like to be homeless and hungry. And if you're homeless and hungry, you can never understand or forgive why your suffering means so little to the people who are comfortable. And yet we have to work together. We have to see each other. What Romero said is, we, the term he used was accompaniment, which means breaking bread together. It means walking down the road together. And in Catholic theology, he said, we need to accompany each other with a preferential option for the poor. And option in English is like a choice on a menu, but in Spanish it's stronger than that. It's like a commitment, a preferential commitment to the poor, to whose voice is going to be left out. And in some cases that may be the poor, and in some cases that may be the undocumented, and in other cases it might be those with disabilities, or it might be the transgendered. But we have to figure out a way to work together without being the same, to have the solidarities of sameness for principle and commitment, but to appreciate the dynamics of difference show us the full complexity of the problems that we're up against. So we want to be, we want to have unity, but not uniformity. Uh, we want to have respect for identities, but we don't want to be identical. And so to me, that's, that's the challenge for us today and in the, in the days ahead. Thanks. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so I see this framework through the lens of health and um, my work as a physician and actually I describe my work um, in, in, in medicine as also accompaniment um, and I think of that also as a musician um, because my, my path is not to necessarily heal someone, it is to accompany them 
through the journey of illness um, to health, and then also to through the journey of the social body being ill to a place where the social body is healthy. Um, and through these disparities that you're discussing um, with all these different groups that have been historically traumatized and marginalized, um, there is what we will find similar between them is um, that's where we can witness the illness of the social body and that's where we can see the, um, the disparities between um, health and wellness. So for me, the, um, my, my work is very practical. I don't spend as much time in scholarship. I'm learning how to do research because I have to do research because my, pa my patients have been shot by police um, in San Francisco. Um, and so I'm learning how to use the tools of privilege of academia um, at, at, at the service of the communities who've enlisted me as their doctor, not just their doctor at the bedside, but their doctor um, in, in society. Um, because there is a wound that's too great for any one of us to heal um, that we need to collectively come together um, to examine and to heal this wound together. Um, so for my practical standpoint, a lot of it has to do about de developing a language where um, health workers can start to identify when we're looking at disease on an individual case, an individual basis, we're starting to see and understand the systemic reasons why that disease is manifesting in that particular way. Um, so when I have a patient who's coming in for their you know, 20th admission, um, who's a crack addict, who has crack lung, um, who's in the hospital, uh, that is a moment to sit and discuss the historical perspective with which that disease is manifesting right then. And it removes from that individual person any um, sort of stigmatization of this experience and puts it in the lens of a historical phenomenon. Um, and what that does for, I've noticed for my patients, and their family systems, it, it empowers them with a language around structural violence and around historical trauma um, that, that couches the experience of illness in a different framework. Um, and it allows me, when I write my doctor's notes at UCSF, and people are like, what is she writing in her notes? To uh, my colleagues, when they pick up that patient or like reading my note and seeing structural underpinnings of disease as my last assessment, then, you know, what, what, you know, what is she she doing and they'll call me like what are you you know what is this about and I think that um, just having the courage to provide a language that is not yet there within the clinical context um, and making my medical students do it and my residents do it and they're like what is she talking about but it's a new way I think it's it's not a way we're trained to think we're trained to think you know disease protein problem drug um, we're designed to think in a very tiny subspecialist perspectives, we're not trained to think systemically around how capitalism or how the colonization of this land or how the enslavement of um, African people or um, other peoples have contributed to these, what, what we're seeing right now. Um, and I think that bringing that lens in has been... Um, <coughs> is part of my own liberation to understanding what is my agency and work and role as a healer physician um, and how can I be most effective if what my goal is is to accompany all people in the struggle for dignity and um, the ability to have the possibility of health um, free of state violence. So, yeah, high five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm honored to be on this panel today. It's really, really great and exciting to have this conversation. Um, so I, you know, on a very practical level, want to um, kind of draw on a specific uh, history of health activism in order to kind of respond to this broader question of kind of uh, how to proceed in a political moment uh, where um, the question of whether we should even be um, talking about race sometimes is being even contested by certain part at sectors of the left, um, which uh, have argued that uh, race-based politics, right, so-called identity politics, have uh, worked against us. And you, you, uh, this argument has been getting made quite a bit recently. If people have been paying attention to some of the left kind of arguments, um, and I want to talk about um, the Young Lords Party, which was. Um, a really incredible um, organization that was um, 
sort of a, a sister organization or whatever a parallel organization to the Black Panther Party that uh, formed in the late 1960s and was active all throughout the 1970s or through the early 19 or, or till up until like 1974. Um, that mostly consisted of young Puerto Ricans that first formed in Chicago and then um, formed chapters throughout other cities. Um, and my work that I've been looking at um, has been really looking at the New York chapter of the Young Horse Party um, as a really fascinating example of the way in which um, groups in this period were taking up uh, the question of health and were using health as a means to agitate um, and to also, um, I think, articulate a vision for a different kind of society. Um, so um, actually, yeah, let me just really back in and I have some kind of opening thoughts that I want to also I'm gonna try not to read too much but I do have some thoughts um, so you know recently we, uh, as I was saying we've heard some vocal critiques from many on the left that race-based politics such as the movement for back black lives are inherently incompatible with uh, you know so-called universalist claims for economic justice um, and you know these uh, so-called identity politics have uh, according to these arguments outlived their usefulness um, and but identity in these critiques um, often takes the feel of being a, a personal choice or a behavior that one can just pursue or reject rather than a historical imposition um, but you know as Rupa was I think raising um, over the last few decades uh, social epidemiology on the other hand has <coughs> elucidated some of the precise ways in which racial inequalities literally become present in the body um, in the form of <coughs> disease and mortality and disparities uh, which Nancy Krieger a famous social epidemiologist has referred to as embodiment um, so you know racial identity identity is evidently more than a mere utterance of, of self-recognition um, that one can either choose to verbalize or not. Um, but where critiques of identity politics, I think, do have purchases in, is, is in the recognition that the political economic system undergirding these disparities, namely capitalism, um, continue to be ignored in much public discourse. Um, identity politics have, in fact, been, of course, cyn cynically deployed by many Democratic Party uh, elites to present themselves as the party of the all-encompassing multicultural republic, um, but while often doing too little to actually engage working class black and Latino and black and brown people. Um, and within the realm of public health, um, there's you know, been an increasing amount of uh, critique of the fact that collection on the data of socioeconomic status uh, remains limited. Um, and um, some uh, medical historians, such as Dorothy Porter, have pointed out how um, North, North American epidemiologists um, have came to emphasize lifestyle um, and behaviors as opposed to the direction taken by their Latin American counterparts uh, who drew on Marxist theory to theorize about how structural inequalities are impacting uh, health. Um, and in recent years, social epidemiologists are realizing that this kind of Latin American social medicine um, is actually a really critical untapped tool. Um, so, you know, I suggest that the Young Lords Party really exemplify um, sort of a North American iteration of this uh, kind of Latin American social medicine that um, drew from this, uh, not directly linked to Latin America, but kind of shared this Marxist analysis of, uh, of health, but also um, had an anti-colonial critique and understanding of the way in which black and brown communities were specifically experiencing oppression within the boundaries of the United States. Um, so. You know, I kind of refer to this as a sort of a subaltern social medicine. Um, and I think um, a very productive amount of thinking and work actually emerged out of this specific kind of way of thinking about health, um, which, you know, I, you know, I'll continue to talk about for, you know, the rest of the panel. Well, thanks. Uh, uh, my directions were um, to suggest that, first of all, to begin to sort of get maybe the three of you going in a conversation, which I think you've opened up. Well, one thing is fascinating, sort of thinking about um, the remarks, which I, I thought were, were wonderful, and with no prior um, sort of rehearsal whatsoever, to <laughs> converge in fascinating sorts of ways. I'm really thinking about this particular moment. On the one hand, um, I don't think that there's any particular shortage of knowledge. I mean, if you go back to the 19th century and think about Virchow and Engels, think about the 20th century, 1939, the work of Salvador Allende, which pinpointed what were later discovered to be social and economic um, determinants of health. Um, there's no shortage of knowledge. Right? There's now, at this point, no shortage of visibility, of actually thinking about whatever you call the language of 
health disparities, of programs that are meant to be able to uh, ameliorate them. And guess what? It doesn't seem to be working. Now we have a particular juncture where sustaining even the forms of hope, um, the forms of being able to think about, to imagine new futures, themselves become as precarious as some of the, f of the life forms to which they're attached. So um, what are some of the sites in which these forms of solidarity, these conversations that might actually open up new critical ideas, where might they emerge? Uh, how is it that we also might think about the registers, the ways in which we talk, the ways in which nurses, physicians, academics, I mean we talk a particular language here at Berkeley which is meant to be unintelligible <laughs> to most people on the planet. Um, and thinking about those within, I, within other spaces, uh, academic spaces, and practices. So what are these? Where can we find spaces where we're not locked within these sort of social fields, mm -hmm. within these narrow languages, um, where we're not confined particular spaces, where we're um, excluding all of the work of health care that's done outside of the doors of the hospital or the clinic? Where would you help us look so that these new types of conversations might occur, but also where they might turn into new life forms um, at this particular juncture. So I mean, that's I'm trying to just give you a little uh, a little space to, to be able to <laughs> keep the conversation going amongst yourselves, and in, in, in a short period of time, we'll open it up then to our audience. Yeah, well, I don't think any of us would uh, disagree with the diagnosis of the, the present conditions as bleak. On the other hand, the, the dark moment of our despair uh, often has the seeds, because, because of necessity, it has the seeds of, of an eventual victory. In some ways, <coughs> moments like this make you face up to the unsolved problems, the unasked questions of the past. There is a lot of knowledge and critique of what, uh, of what has gone wrong. Uh, years ago, uh, a great organizer named Willie Ricks used to uh, he was wor working for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and people would come down and they'd hand him manifestos and analyses that they had written about the condition of SNCC and what SNCC should be doing. And Willie Ricks always used to say, you know, these brothers think Mr. Say is the man, but really down here it's Mr. Do. And so something about the doing, about the masses in motion, about people acting, is where those truths are really tested. And you know, we tend to think of things as true because they're validated in peer research, because there's a consensus of scholars around them. It's when ideas and evidence grips the masses and people refuse unlivable destinies on their own terms that we get the new practices, the new languages that can transform things. Uh, when you look at uh, the I Don't Know More mobilization in Canada and Standing Rock of people being, you know, uh, uh, seeing indigenous dispossession as an ongoing reality and not simply a past event and insisting on being unapologetically sovereign and indigenous. When you see the movement for black lives in which people um, are proclaiming that they actually don't have to audition to be considered part of humanity, that they can wear the clothes they wear and speak the language they wear and resist people who are coming to kill them, you see a really serious project of social transformation already, uh, already underway. And I think that one of the impulses of accompaniment is not just to broaden the base or change the language, uh, but in some ways it's also to uh, see that social movements generate new knowledge, that social movements are the places where uh, critique gets turned into action, and those actions produce new social relations, new identities, new ways of knowing, uh, uh, et, et cetera. So I think that um, we're at an interesting moment where if you look at the society from the top down, from the political system, from the corporate media, there appears to be no space for anything at all. But if you walk with the houseless organizers on 6th Street and Skid Row in Los Angeles, if you attend the classes of Asian immigrant women advocates on 8th Street in Oakland where they're teaching uh, low-wage immigrant women, limited English-speaking workers to uh, develop their capacity for leadership, if you attend the Say Her Name forums that uh, we've been running with the African American Policy Forum where black women testify to the nature of 
uh, structural violence, police violence, criminal violence, partner violence, the violence of housing insecurity and hunger, you see that people are already uh, uh, organizing, mobilizing, uh, speaking up about the conditions that, that affect them. And the, the task, I think, is to trust that, uh, to trust that people uh, asserting their agency on their own terms uh, have something uh, are, are the first step toward that critique. Uh, the beat poet Bob Kaufman uh, used to be teased because they thought he was uh, too far out, you know, that he had ideas that were too wild. And he said, uh, you know, sometimes way out people know the way out. And I think in our society, uh, we need to look to uh, where the critiques are coming from, which is where they've always come from, and that is the people who can't afford to lie, who can't afford to swallow the poison of the dominant media who have to tell the truth because their life depends on it. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, I think about the difference between people who are talking about police reform right now um, versus the abolitionists in the room, um, of which I consider myself. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm working with families whose children have been um, executed by police, there's no time to reform the police. Um, we've given the police a chance to reform, and the executions are still continuing. And so I think that exactly that, just looking to where these movements are occurring. Um, for myself, I was very deeply inspired by my time at Standing Rock serving as a physician um, with um, other uh, physician, indigenous and non-indigenous and nurses and medics in the camps there on the front line um, because um, it was an experience where I was learning how to lead by following and by um, and witnessing um, how I can use my white coat privilege in mm -hmm. spaces um, to, get, to to go behind um, what where, where the people were moving and how they were moving, and um, those those kinds of occurrences right now here at the Berkeley West Berkeley Shell Mound, that's another experience of genocidal activity of cultural erasure of the original people, the Ohlone Chichenyo Ohlone people. Um, where the city of Berkeley, now the state of California, is um, you know, trying to push through a development on the oldest inhabited, continually inhabited site in the Bay Area, um, which um, Ohlone matriarch uh, Karina Gould has been trying to preserve and is a sacred site to her people. So I think that um, finding those movements that are actually actively ongoing right now, because the, the, those they know what they need and then just you know getting behind them instead of trying to direct it um, one other group that's been extremely inspiring to me um, has been the work of tiny garcia um, in the homefulness um, organization in oakland where um, she has uh, the poverty scholars if anyone can take the next poverty scholars class will be in august um, where they're developing a whole system of scholarship through the experience of poverty and through giving um, poor people voices and um, opportunity to publish and and give voice to their experience and self-organize and self-educate um, another thing that's been extremely inspiring to me because I'm doing it myself um, is decolonizing our own education system so I have a four and a half year old kid um, and inspired by my indigenous um, friends who have children who refuse to put their children into a schooling system that they then have to unschool them in um, and also following the people's movements in Udaipur in India um, we're starting our own earth-based um, schooling cooperative in Oakland to educate our children around issues of earth care, swarage, self self autonomy, dignity and community responsibility. So these are ways where, you know, through the actions of understanding what the problem is and then translating it into action items just for yourself in your community and then also looking at what people are doing who are at the on the margins and getting behind them. What was depressing to me about the pussy hat situation um, was <clears throat> I was waiting for those folks to show up when Jesus Adolfo Delgado was shot by 99 bullets in the back of a trunk. I was waiting for those people to show up um, again and again when Salim Tyndall was killed by um, the police, BART police, on January 3rd. Um, and they didn't show up. And so I feel like people who might be critiquing the identity politics being divisive um, 
just don't show up. And that's the, that's the problem, is when the situation is desperate to the point where people are being murdered in the street and there's no justice for those murders, um, this is where we need to mobilize. And, it's, and because we have historically expected Native people to be um, subject to genocide, historically expected black and brown people's bodies to be brutalized by the state, it's part of our cultural conditionment. And so um, we don't activate. The culture does not <coughs> activate. When I was at Standing Rock, I was watching a line of um, security people. I don't know if they were police officers or hired military people, um, contractors, firing rubber grenades into the bodies at close range of young native, like 16-year-old kids. And I, and I saw a young, um, young man cough up a cup of blood into his hand in front of my face. And he just coughed up a cup and I was like, oh God, he could exsanguinate. He might have ruptured a pulmonary artery. There's documented cases of con uh, these rubber bullets at close range in the chest causing exsanguination. And so I looked at him and I said, you know, uh, you, know you need to get out of here. Um, there was a trauma surgeon who's Cherokee and I there. I'm like, we can't, we can't handle this if, you're ex if this is a ruptured artery go to Bismarck and get you to the hospital he said they're so racist there I'd rather just sit here and die with you I'd rather like just be in in the space of compassion and meanwhile a grandmother is sitting there next to me crying and saying how long do I have to watch white military shoot into brown native bodies crying the historical trauma just re-triggered and so I think that you know I, I think these are moments flashpoints and moments where in our critical imagination as um, people who are interested in the liberation of all people, um, we, we have to get up close and personal and then just activated in our own communities about it in, 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 a, in a way that's amplified way, way louder than what's happening right now. Um, so, you know, pussy hat's great, but I, I, I want to see it for every insult that's happening. It needs to be every insult. Um, and I know it's a lot of energy, but it's that's where you know the call to shut this whole thing down um, until we can see some of this systemic change. Um, as a doctor, that's the place where I'm at because we're at a state of emergency um, with um, what's happening to people's bodies. So. Yeah, so you know, I, I started um, researching the Young Lords Party while I was doing my um, <coughs> massive public health work. Um, and I turned to that history and was really excited about it because um, within public health in the last few years, there's been a shift to talk about community organizing uh, much more. And there's been kind of a move to talk about um, this concept of the social determinants of health, right? So this idea that, you know, starting to turn to this idea of um, how uh, the economy, how um, racism impacts health, right, and creates health disparities. So within at least a certain pole of, of public health, this is starting to become sort of accepted language, right? Um, yet, um, you know, the, the framework still felt in many ways very limited, and also the, the kind of ideas that emerged out of that framework about how to address them also felt incredibly, incredibly limited. Um, and you know this kind of uh, th there's sort of this idea that it started to you know they started to kind of put forward this idea many practitioners within public health of sort of a liberal community organizing model um, and you know this is really a fantastic move in some ways um, for public health which has been traditionally focused so um, emphatically on changing people's behaviors um, so it started to look at how we can change conditions that people live in right um, yet it kind of continues to do that and continues to do that in many ways um, in the absence of any sort of um, structural real analysis right and kind of ideological work that I think is needed to really try to understand the system that we're living in right to try to really unpack and actually talk about white supremacy right to talk and, and unpack capitalism right um, and so you know it was really fascinating to me when I started learning about the young lords and the way in which they talked about health was always in the context of those things, right? Um, and, it, and it was because they weren't specifically, of course, a health organization, right? That wasn't 
primarily what the Young Lords were formed to do, it, but it flowed out of their political analysis. Um, and it flowed out of also their understanding that in order to get people on board with their political analysis, that they needed to engage with people in their everyday lived and material experiences, right? Um, so, you know, it, the, the kind of work that they did was at such a fundamentally grassroots level, um, yet always kind of trying to animate a certain sort of politics. And, and I think um, it really was about the work of um, articulating a, a different kind of future for black and brown people, right? Um, so just as an example, I mean, I, the, the Young Lords kind of the very, uh, the New York chapter of the Young Lords specifically, which I kind of focused on in my work, um, one of the kind of early things was this thing that they called the garbage offensive, um, where, you know, uh, at this time in the late 1960s, of course, um, Puerto Ricans living in the Lower East Side and East Harlem were living in, you know, slum housing primarily. Um, garbage was not being picked up on the streets on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, they, a as they formed as an organization, went around asking just regular people what they thought were the main issues affecting their community. And it, it turned out, of course, garbage was like a main issue, right? So in, in a sense, what they were kind of doing was sort of an informal form of data collection, right? I think what we today would refer to as like a popular epidemiology, right? Um, and, you know, in response, they demanded that the city give them um, brooms to start to sweep up the garbage themselves. Um, they started to do that on a weekly basis. Um, and then, um, you know, but it, the problem still persisted, right? The, the garbage collection never kind of came in. So they started to actually just sweep the garbage into the street. Um, and they started to blockade major streets in Manhattan. Um, and at a certain point, that garbage was turned on fire, right? And um, this, they realized, was a way of getting media attention and, you know, of a, civil, a form of civil disobedience, right? Um, and it, it worked. I mean, the city came and actually removed the garbage, right? So, I mean, this was just kind of one of their early forays of, and, and kind of, a, I think, an early example of how they worked to um, kind of use the issues that were primarily affecting people, but also to put forward this idea of uh, decolonizing their neighborhood. And that's sort of what the idea was. It was like, this is our neighborhood. Yeah, we'll clean up because the city isn't doing it, but we'll also show, we'll show the inefficiency of the system behind it. And we're also gonna it, put our bodies and this garbage that's literally being placed here um, that is being that we are being blamed for creating, and we're going to force the city to pick it up themselves. And so it was a form of direct action that they also engaged in. So, anyways, I, I think it's to me it was a really fascinating uh, example. And there's plenty more that uh, you know we'll probably keep talking about. <laughs> there's there's two seats up here if you all want to come yeah. in, and there's probably room if you want to sit on the floor if if it's comfortable. The tables are very solid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want, to, I want to build on what Carlos was saying. We, we've been presenting examples of uh, things that we think have possibility. Uh, I want to talk about the illogic of what's logical. So what's logical is to work with the system, to work with the large institutions, uh, to build unity around the, the, the simplest um, uh, common denominator. And I want to relate to you uh, the lessons learned in the labor movement about that the costs of taking the path of least resistance. So I want to talk to you about Stan Weir, who was a white working class kid, went to Garfield High School in East LA, and became a member of the Sailors Union of the Pacific. And when he joined the union, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to him in his life, because he was used to living in a neighborhood of working people where grown men would be shamed by their bosses, would have to bribe them with a bottle of whiskey to get a better place on the assembly line, where those men came home embittered and beat their children and their wives, and the children then uh, expressed that anger elsewhere. And when Stan got on the ships, the merchant ships that had been organized by the Sailors Union of the Pacific, he saw working men who were, uh, looked each other in the eye, who looked the boss in the eye, uh, who had a list of demands about how work ought to operate. 
And he wanted to be like that. He, he wanted to be like those kinds of guys because this was a form of working class life that had a dignity that he hadn't experienced. And so he became a passionate, militant member of the Sailors Union of the Pacific. In between ships traveling here and there, he'd work on shore from time to time. He was also a member of the Workers' Party, a Shackmanite Trotskyist group uh, uh, that had split off from the Socialist Workers' Party. And he wanted to recruit other militants into his, 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 his uh, for formation. He's working at the Calypso restaurant in New York City in Greenwich Village. There's a young worker four years younger than him who's incredibly bright who seems to share the same opinions that Stan has. The young man is James Baldwin, who goes on to be the novelist that everyone knows. But he's just a 19-year-old kid from Harlem as far as Stan knows at this point. And Stan tries to recruit Baldwin into the Workers' Party. And into, he says, look, uh, you're against capitalism. Uh, here's our position paper on empire. Here's our position paper on racism. We agree with everything you've been saying. You ought to join us. And Baldwin says, look, Stan, you know this wouldn't work. You're in an all-white union, the Sailors Union of the Pacific. Your group is almost all-white. I'd be, I'd be really conspicuous in it. I'm somebody who has romantic and erotic relations with men. And so that's going to cause a problem if I'm part of your group. And Stan says, no, Jimmy, you got it all wrong. We're the one group you can join because it doesn't matter to us that you're black. It doesn't matter to us that you're gay. And Baldwin says, but Stan, it matters to me. Because what they were offering him was an inclusion that involved deracination. He would have to disappear as himself. And what Baldwin felt is not only that his interests wouldn't be represented, but that there was a kind of impoverished vision about what justice was. That the class injury could be remedied, but the gender injury or the, or the homophobic injury or the racial injury would have to wait. And that people who succeeded in that way would never be able to be part of the kind of broad-based movement of liberation that his idea of being a worker meant. We're, and, and Baldwin remain friends. Baldwin goes into, the, uh, goes, become a writer, part of the civil rights movement. Stan becomes part of the International Longshore and Warehousemen's Union. He unloads coffee, bags of coffee on a pier in San Francisco where now you can buy lattes for $12. But in those days, he was hauling by hand these sacks. And he loved, he loved the labor movement. And he was uh, in the movement with uh, what were called the B-men, who were a particular class of people who often worked in the hold. There were two thirds of them were black. Uh, the union, as a condition of accepting modernization, uh, brought in a new two-tiered way of organizing. And so the B-men were fired, including most of the black men. Uh, Weir was part of this. They lost, they got defeated. Years later, and you can read about this in his book, Single Jack Solidarity, he says, I didn't know at the time what Baldwin was telling me, because we built a labor movement that could make a class critique of what's wrong in the society. But by making it a male critique, we squandered the talents and abilities of working class women. By making it a heteronormative critique and wanting to have the family wage, we created a sexual dictatorship out of what could have been a sexual democracy. And by bracketing race as a special injury only of concern to blacks, we didn't understand how the company and the union would make blacks a segment of the workforce that would always undercut the union wages that we had won. And so we were creating a competitor with, of, of, for ourselves that would always load down our wages. By keeping blacks in the ditch, we had to be down there in the ditch with them. So it isn't just that the movement failed to realize a utopian solution. It was that it compromised its own vision of social justice by having too narrow a frame of, of injury and remedy. All of the issues that appeared to get in the way, that appeared to be extraneous, that Stan Weir didn't care about, some, whether somebody's gay, whether somebody's black, were registers of how power works in this society. And by bracketing them, you weren't really prepared to deal with the dispersed nature of power. If power would stand correctly for you and only uh, injure you in a class form, you might be able to deal with it. But we don't have a class system and a racial system and a sex and gendered system. Those systems are all together. They're part of each other. And so without that framework, which the Lords had, and they could see garbage wasn't being picked up in, in the Bronx because they were from the longest continuous colony in the history of the world, but also because they were forced to live 
uh, in neighborhoods that uh, white supremacy had relegated people of yes. color to mm -hmm. and enabled whites to move away from. Mm -hmm. And whites felt if they could just keep moving away, they wouldn't be pulled down. But in doing that, they created the third ghetto. They created the very conditions of poverty and crime that they thought that they were afraid of. So it's not just that there's an optimal, you know, we're, we're not just inverted snobs who say, let, let, let's, let's give the preferential option to the poor. We're saying if you're going to seriously analyze the way power works, the eyewitnesses to the worst that the society has to offer are in a unique position to formulate changes. And if we're not in, in accompaniment with them, then any separate piece that we want to make will not only be at their expense, it'll be at our expense too. This is what this is a perfect analysis of, I feel, what happened, the disintegration of the left during the last election. Um, I was personally like attacked with vitriol by a prominent white feminist for my repeated stance that you know Hillary Clinton feminism did not represent the interest of brown and black people um, in around the world so my my interest in feminism was to make sure that women in Afghanistan and boys in Afghanistan would not continue to be raped at the rates that they're being raped or that the wars in Syria and um, across the Middle East were not continuing to endanger the lives um, and cause these like mass migrations of refugees that was directly a part of her policy. And so um, being attacked by prominent liberal white feminists who called me hateful and rageful because I kept insisting on the racial issues, um, you're, divi you're divisive, your language is divisive, can't we all just come together, aren't we all part of the same team? It's like, well, if we're not able to have this language to articulate these differences and come to the table with these differences, we, we actually might not be part of the same team. And this is not a time where that, that center, that center can, we can't afford for um, that dissolution. Um, so we, sh we really need to start to think critically about what are the divisive voices um, and how we can honor each other's um, perspectives without, you know, tearing apart at the solidarity. But I think I think that's a perfect example brought into like the modern, like what's happening right now. They didn't accuse you of being racist. <laughs> uh, she she said I was hateful and ra rageful. So I was a hateful and rageful person. Probably not racist too. Probably. So the people of color now can be racist. I'm so racist. <laughs> so um, <laughs> speaking of spaces of difference and solidarity mm -hmm. right. and unusual creative spaces. We actually have one here, which is a uh, coming together of a of the National Nurses United California Nurses Association and the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine. So Berkeley Center for Social Medicine, particularly looking for non-US as well as US based models of what it is, how can we think about the production of ill health in ideological terms and material terms and things beyond any sort of medicalized understanding of health. Um, and also with here working with a union and particularly with a whole range of different sorts of ideas and insights for coming together. So I thought, how would we make this into one of those particularly innovative and creative sorts of spaces? My proposal would be, why don't we potentially take a number of hopefully brief comments and questions from the audience, collect those, and then give the, um, the, the um, floor back to the three of you. Would that, would that work out sure. well? So please. Yes. Hold up your head. I will try to be able to get all of your, to get you down, get to you in order that I see your hands. But please, if you can hold your comments and questions relatively brief, then we can collect a lot of them and we can hear as many voices as possible. Please, go ahead. Oh, it, you know, you all seem to be taking the words right out of the uh, lead uh, point man on condemning uh, so-called identity politics, Mark Lilla. Oh. And when Mark Lilly came here to speak, you know, I, I thought it was what I would call the white, the, the white racist alt liberal clan rally, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I said so to him uh, civilly. And his idea seemed to be that identity politics were just you know uh, various people, various historically oppressed minorities, only parochially and narrowly self-concerned with their own interest and the exclusion of everyone else. And as anyone in the Black Panthers among the probably young lords too would know that uh, oppressed, historically oppressed, the people have always engaged in uh, coalition politics. And I felt that the November 2017 special election uh, really reputed Lilla, who doesn't seem to realize that there's such a thing as 
as white male identity politics. That is called universal. So I'm wondering, um, you all have talked a lot about it, but I've been trying to encourage journalism friends of mine to, to ask people what they mean when they say identity politics. And so I'd like any or, or all of you like say what what you mean by identity politics, and if you wanted that, I guess, what you think these white condemners of identity politics mean by identity politics. Thank you. Um, earlier you talked about um, the abolition of, or the abolishing of the policing. Um, I'm sorry if this is a simple comment, um, but could you expand more on what that means and what that can look like? at least a couple more here. Um, so I guess what I'm thinking is um, this is something that I'm thinking about a lot, the intersection between identity politics and class. Um, uh, well, presumably, I guess what I've been thinking is presumably the racial injustice is unjust because it has an effect on the material conditions of your life and the sort of material possibilities of your of one's life, and um, so I guess um, uh, uh, I guess I'm wondering, like, is it really so, is there really so, so much of a division between sort of class and what we would call other categories of identity, which are you know necessary to acknowledge? And I, I agree, the labor movement hasn't acknowledged that in the past, and to its to you know its great detriment. Um, but presumably, it is unjust because it has actual material sort of it affects you in a material way. So um, is there a way to, yeah, how can we keep keep our identities, our identities and, and the experiences that, are, that we have because of our identities connected to a Marxist cr critique of the material, material historical material? I'm, I'm hoping that the next voice will not be that of a cell phone. So you might make sure if you have one of those apparatuses that it's turned off. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's good to see you, Charles and George. And, uh, remembering some of them back, back when your mustaches were darker. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think George's seminary paraphrasing James Baldwin's something about the moment you can articulate a movement, you no longer belong to it. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of feel like in this space, this is what we're doing. There's always a disconnect of like, where we should have these meetings and discussions. And I, I think, you know, from academia to being a labor movement, I still always feel disconnected from the movements I'm a part of. And, and sometimes there's this thought, you know, because of my training, what I do, that like there's a deficiency when we talk about the masses or working classes or people of color or women and trans communities. Like there's always like, I mean, we don't do it, but there's this ingrained nature to think of it as something that needs to be solved and something that needs to be fixed and like, you know, the expertise that we can provide to the table. So it's more of a comment and maybe just to expand upon that and just to give to some both of you. Do you think that you might have enough to work with here? Yeah. Should we take a couple more? This is a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, so please. Carlos, why don't you start us off? Okay. Uh, Sorry about that. Man. No, no, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrap your yeah. so over. I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have the same name in Spanish. So. Right, right. Uh, I don't know exactly where to start, but um, I think, uh, well, with the question of abolition, I feel like our comrade Lee Herzing from criti formerly still Critical Resistance really should be answering that question here, talking about people in the movement. <laughs> but um, I feel like, well, with, with the question of, um, you know, since I think we're all kind of responding to, to identity politics, you know, just l as I said earlier, I think, what, you know, to answer kind of your question. Well, people should know Mark Lewis and call me. Ab absolutely, yeah, and and so he's the kind of the guy that really pisses me off uh, personally. <laughs> it really annoys me, you know, in particular, along with Steven Pinker, who also is like kind of one of these other kind of people that um, is coming from uh, this kind of liberal critique of identity politics. Um, and kind of what I'll say is that, as I think I maybe made a little bit clear at, at the beginning, or maybe I need to clarify more, is. Um, you know, there's such a thing as having a liberal critique of identity politics, and another thing, and there's it's another thing to have a left critique of identity politics, mm -hmm. right? Um, and whereas we both both might be critiquing identity politics, we're doing it from fundamentally different places, right? And so, whereas liberal, the kind of the liberal critique sort of is along the lines of what you were talking about. This, uh, I mean, the, 
with Steven Pinker and others, it's sort of like this, you know, it's it's moving us away from this united and also what you were saying, kind of uh, identity as a civil society or something. And then it, this also has led to this sort of supposed backlash. Supposedly identity politics is the reason that Trump won the election, for example, right? Um, um, and, and, and then kind of a left critique of identity politics would be that um, identity politics, as it gets discussed, um, I, I think doesn't really equal racial justice, right? Um, that those are two fundamentally different things, right? Um, racial justice um, requires a much deeper and broader structural discussion, right? Again, it's not that identity is simply this behavior or something that I just vocalize as an individual. It's something that's been historically constructed, right? That's dependent upon all these other constellations of power. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Well, um, I, I think that the um, question has to be who, who's singling out identities and why do identities matter? And they matter because of they arbitrarily, artificially, irrationally skew opportunities and life chances. There is a material element to it. But there's also a greater loss uh, because of that, that the narrow notion uh, you know, if you don't have identity politics, you're simply accepting white masculinity as the unmarked norm against which difference is measured. So, as you said, it is an identity politics. And the harm with that isn't just unequal pay. The harm with that isn't just concentrating power where it's always been. It takes, it's an artificial, arbitrary, and irrational way to organize society. And so you squander talents and abilities. You misallocate resources. You put people in positions of high power who should not be there, and you refuse to listen to people with extraordinary abilities and insights who are witnesses whose testimony is disallowed before you even begin to speak. There's an injury to human dignity, but there's also an injury to democratic decision making here in addition to the, to the material injury. The idea that there's either identity politics or universal politics is deeply rooted in the way most disciplines on this campus and other campuses operate. The, the binaries that organize Western thought and the goes back to Plato's great chain of being where things that are different from are automatically better than or worse than. They can't just be, be different from. Aimé Césaire, the surrealist poet and, and activist from Martinique said, I'm not for um, a disembodied universalism. I'm not for humanity as if it's your humanity, as if Europe is all of humanity. But I'm not for a per particular parochialism either. Not for a disembodied universalism, not for a parochial particularism. That's the way it's divided to us. You, you have your own narrow interest group or you're for everybody. What Césaire says, I'm for a universal that's rich with particulars, that involves the autonomy of each the dignity of all and the supremacy of none. And so this is a way of thinking about identity as fluid and flexible, as changing, but on the other hand, as a source of strength rather than a source of weakness, as a way of, of increasing um, our, our optics uh, on, on, on power. I think the part of what we're up against in this is also, uh, and again, I, I, I'm not a physician, I'm not a nurse, but it seems to me if somebody has a boil, you don't think you could just treat it at the boil, because the boil indicates there's an imbalance in the whole system, and you have to attend to that. This is what social epidemiology has been helping us see, as opposed to a, a more narrow biomedical model. Similarly, the tort model of injury and law doesn't really do justice to the ways in which power and injuries are, are wielded and, and experienced. If a part of the body has a problem, you try to heal the whole body. You don't amputate the part that's simply diseased. In our society, we look at people with problems as problems. We blame and shame people who control next to nothing and blame them for everything, and the people who control nearly everything get blamed for nothing. And we imagine that we can solve our problems by amputating the problem areas. Uh, urban renewal destroyed 1,600 black communities uh, it, it, with the idea that we would get rid of slums. Well, you just move the slums around then. You create new opportunities uh, for exploitation. So we want to have that holistic thing. Now, as for Theo, I'm, I'm going to be no better, no more successful today than I was 20 years ago in a seminar, but let me try one more time. If you think about movements as artificial, as sources of anxiety, as us separate from the movements, as what movements do we need to devise, it's a, it's a very fraught enterprise. 
But if you think of it differently, and again, the idea of accompaniment is valuable to me, then we have a different way of operating. Uh, Emil Carr Cabral, who led the liberation struggle in Guinea-Bissau, was once told, you can't be a revolutionary in this country because we have no mountains. And when they're revolutionaries, <laughs> they always go up to the mountains and they hide out and they're safe from the, the oppressive forces. And so you really can't be a revolutionary here because we have no mountains. And Cabral said, well, our, the people will be our mountains. So we'll be in among and with the people. Uh, we'll, be, we'll, we'll, we'll put our destiny with them. And of course, this is, not, this is never a seamless, imperfect imper practice. Chela Sandoval says that uh, any identity, even a revolutionary one, is a consensual illusion. It's something that you declare tactically for certain purposes. The minute you declare unity, all the sources of difference come to the fore. And so we're looking for a kind of floating equilibrium about this. We're not building into, into, in, into one fixed identity. But on the other hand, the survival and dignity of people of color and all people is on the line. And to say that we, we don't have the, uh, the perfect formulation uh, to, to jump on is no reason not to get into, into the fray. Uh, if, we, if we wanted to go to downtown Oakland and we stood on Shattuck and waited for the perfect bus to come along, it would never get there, you know? So this, one, this one's a little homophobic. This one is insensitive to class. I don't know about this bus. Bus is moving. Get on and see what happens. Yeah, I think that celebration of the, the beauty of the pluralism of these movements, so not enforcing a uniformity, um, but embracing the pluralism and gathering our strength from the pluralism um, was also something very beautiful about what I witnessed at Standing Rock because there was a, a pluralism of indigenous cultures from around the world and they were all united by the water. They were all united because water is being threatened in all of their places and their way of life is being threatened because of that water. Um, so there was unity and pluralism at the same time. And some of these tribes were tribes that historically would have slaughtered each other mm -hmm. uh, you know, 200 years ago, who are now coming together and understanding that in order to create sy systemic change, there needs to be um, a deeper coalition. Um, I also think that we're at an interesting moment historically where the white male perspective is um, being decentralized um, and so I think that, that that fact not just here but around the world so coming from India where my own country is still very much a colonized country oh my god it's becoming colonized by Trump <laughs> I just heard on the news right now um, but it's still a very colonized mentality in India um, just around the world what I've noticed in traveling with my band through you know Athens Greece witnessing what's happening with um, the movement of refugees in the Zapatista territories um, I, and, and through South Asia, I see that there's a, a global conversation right now around the rise of the voice of the othered um, for centuries, the global South um, entering the dialogue in, in a louder sense, not just here in the United States. And I think that is very threatening. Um, and also, I want to say the rise of women is very mm -hmm. threatening to the architecture of patriarchy, the hegemonic structure of white male supremacy that has dominated the entire globe for several centuries. So I think that that um, becomes a moment to say, oh, well, let's not talk about identity um, because it becomes very uncomfortable and um, it points to the, the, so now, uh, the decentralization of the white male heteronormative perspective. Um, and, and so, to me, I, I see it as a, um, a real exciting moment to embrace the pluralism. Um, and with regards to abolition, um, so yeah, Critical Resistance is doing great work around prison ab abolition. For the groups that I work with um, around police violence, um, one of the, the thoughts that has come to us has been, uh, can we move community safety into the de departments of health and human services? So if we can restructure cities' response <coughs> to um, crisis by, um, you know, staffing it the way you'd staff a hospital. 
So if you have 10% of your 911 calls are um, child abuse or inter um, interpersonal violence, you staff with 10% of people who are actually trained in that work so you're not showing up with a gun um, to re-traumatize victims of trauma. If you are a sanctuary city, you have a department of sanctuary services within your health and human services. If you have mental health issues, you have a department, you have he mental health specialists who respond to those crises. And then there's a crime unit. And the crime unit might be like 10% of your calls, but it doesn't get 100% of the budget. And it doesn't mean that everyone who shows up shows up with a gun. Um, so you put these things in their proper spaces under different auspices that already have regulatory mechanisms and oversight and licensing that um, right now the no police, um, no police department in the United States has. Um, so it's trying to um, just take, that, take what the community needs um, and reappropriate it to new structures that are health oriented. Um, also, the, 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 the people working in crime could, would, would mandatorily have to be people who live in that community and are from that community. Um, so that security of a community is coming from within the groups that know that community. Um, one of the most striking things of the body cam footage from the assassination of Jesus um, Alfonso Delgado from March um, 6th was the, the southern drawl of the officer who was demanding that he get his hands up and get out of the car and escalated um, to the point of shooting him 99 times with 10 other police officers. So it's like, who is that person? Where are they from? Why did it take t you know 10 minutes to get a Spanish speaker on the scene when this was someone who they knew this was in a Spanish speaking community in San Francisco? Um, so these are the kinds of things where we could be doing this whole thing much differently differently um, and organizing um, much more intelligently for the benefit of our communities. We'll turn it back. I mean, your interesting remarks remind me also of Etienne Balibar's um, wonderful essay on identity where he says, what are identities? They seem to be discrete, autonomous, bounded, and stable. And fundamentally what they are is contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, the contradictions between particularly the idea that I make my own identity. But if you walk into as a, um, into most doctor's offices as a Latino or an African American, right? The assumptions that are made about your ability to understand what the doctor is saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be able to transform that into a different model of disease and health, to embody that in behavior, um, will be different upon the identity which is imposed upon you such that you will get worse care. Mm -hmm. So one might want to think about identities as always being these problematic, unstable, um, sorts of identities that really revolve around contradictions that are very hard to control. So now I think we get another round of interventions from our uh, esteemed participants on the other side. I won't call them audience <laughs> members because that <laughs> would divide us I I wrongly. Please. So actually, uh, related to your just recent comment, I'm wondering if any of you guys have a comment on how all of these elements uh, combine to influence the specific doctor-patient relationship because I think um, despite the fact that there are many things we can do to sort of change things in a more global way um, fundamentally if there is an issue between two people in the doctor-patient relationship you're not going to get very far in patient care so Great. if you guys have so we also might want to say um, patient health professionals, yeah. <laughs> given the fact we have a lot of nurses in the room. Um, great. So other interventions, please? Questions? Comments? Boy, I, um, I don't know. You seem to be a rather um, a, a less vociferous set of interlocutors than I had imagined. <laughs> <laughs> other interventions? Please. <laughs> Yeah, someone who has the history of working with community organizations as well for the educational system. I'm very familiar with what uh, those young lords did in New York when they organized the Lincoln Brigade. Yeah. My area of expertise has been mental health in Western New York. I think one of the critical issues here that we need to be talking about is one of the not to capitalism as it affects the mental health and the health care system. What we know is now health care is about profit. We're trying to combat all these things we're talking about. Capitalism going to see how does it benefit them. But I think what we need to look at critically is how to engage the masses. One of the things that I think is very important is respect their knowledge. Here's some historical examples we can learn from this point of view. 
Look at this group that I work with, like the center called National Welfare Rights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These were uneducated women from all across the country, black, white, Latino, who forced to change the, the welfare system. They empowered themselves. I think as educated people in the middle class, we need to take our expertise to listen to them. But we need to look at too much, we're too much involved in campaigns. We don't do protracted organizing. We don't do long-term organizing. We go on with campaigns. We need to look at how can we begin to structure and change the system over time. Thank you. That's more of a comment than a question. That's good. That's, comments are fine, too. So um, it, it looks like we're back to the panel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. I'm good at following directions. So your specific question was how does how do these issues play out in the in the provider patient relationship? How do these issues come to task? Yeah. Um, so I um, I think that a lot of our work has to be internal work um, in in terms of now we're doing implicit bias training um, there's great there's been great studies that have come out of Harvard um, that that you can do online actually to see what your implicit biases are um, and and also changing the culture of medicine I think to be able to talk with your colleagues very openly um, I had a, a this is just an anecdote but I had a a black woman come in with back pain who every time she coughed um, she would get chest pain and she was just there with back pain she was coughing she's like oh my chest my chest and she had a very histrionic personality and so all the providers were inclined to just be like okay let's just give her some cough medicine give her some cough medicine so one day I was like let me put an EKG on you because I know I think the New England Journal study just came out that black women get have the worst health outcomes with heart attacks because they're not listened to so i'm like okay let me let me just try this so i put an ekg on her and every time she coughed she had st elevations she was having a heart attack i said oh my oh my god so i called the cardiologist and i said can you please cath this lady because i I think she has a bridge artery going through her you know myocardium so that when her interthoracic pressure is increased it's collapsing the artery and she's having cardiac issues and he said well send her to my outpatient clinic I said this woman will never show up to your outpatient clinic I know this woman I've known her for five years she will never show up she's here in the hospital she's gonna be here for a couple days with back pain let's just do a cath and and um, he refused to do the cath and so finally I said (laughs) um, you know I don't want this woman to become a statistic that black women get worse medical care um, around heart attacks than everybody else because the medical institution doesn't listen to them and he said are you calling me a racist and I said well I <laughs> I said uh, well I think our system is racist and we're all participate we're all participants in the system and I'm trying to check myself and I had and I had to check myself and actually go she's <coughs> saying chest pain get an EKG like that's what you're trained to do why wasn't I doing it right and so I think a part of it is just um, starting to unlearn our own implicit biases from that we've <coughs> been raised with in this society and challenge yourself with each patient encounter now I just challenge myself when I'm looking at black indigenous Latino person I challenge myself okay what am I not seeing what am I not asking because I'm a part of this system and 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 it, through that own self inquiry and examination, I also now start you know talking with my colleagues. Like, look what I missed. Look what happened. Um, so this becomes part of my own internal social medicine morbidity and mortality, where we start reaching to our colleagues and trying to change the actual culture. Call me out. Tell me when I've missed something, because um, that's going to make me a better provider. Because I am racist. I was raised in this society. There's no way I'm not racist. Um, so we have to accept that humility um, and, and you know, just keep working to deconstruct it. Um, but, I, but I think it is, it is very challenging and I definitely got a call from my boss that day, like, are you calling the cardiologist racist? And I had to send them the New England Journal article and said, no, I was actually referring to this piece of scholarship that, you know, we're all racist here. Like, look at the bad care we're giving. And so um, I think that it's just learning to take these studies when they do come out and put them into the lexicon of everyday use. And now, like last week when I was on service, I had a nephrologist say to me, 
Rupa, I'm concerned that this person didn't get her medical, mm -hmm. he didn't get her cancer workup because of systemic racism. He said that. I was like, thank you. And so I called down to the nuclear yeah. med test. I'm like, why hasn't this been scheduled in three months? We're concerned this could be systemic racism. <laughs> and they scheduled it right away. And I'm like, okay, that's the new buzzword that I can now use at UCSF to get my tests through for people who I would be waiting for. And so I think it's part of just changing the culture and changing our awareness, patient by patient. Are you taking patients? No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, um, so building off of th this specific set of uh, questions and, and, uh, and comments, um, I think this is where this um, concept of structural competency, this pivot towards structural competency from cultural competency is really important, um, which structural competency is, is a kind of a newer concept that's being developed by people like Seth Holmes, Kelly Knight, and others here. Um, where you know cultural competency was really trying to look at um, trying to understand the culture of the person to try to intervene and, and, and sort of supposedly better pro provide them with better health, right? And and, uh, and on some more sensitive care. more sensitive right. care, culturally competent uh, or culturally sensitive, you know, which became very much part of the kind of medical training, I think, throughout the 90s and thousands, which I think was um, an important early sort of recognition of difference of the fact that, you know, you, we are, you know, you are a white doctor who's working with non-white people and that there's, there's something that needs to be understood about the patient-doctor uh, interaction there that is potentially cultural. Uh, but where structural competency is now sort of saying that it's not simply the, it, the culture, this kind of static idea of a culture of, of the patient that is entering uh, sort of the hospital. It's the conditions that those people are living in, right? It's the systemic racism. Yeah. It's the literal li living conditions, whether you're living in sort of uh, poorly ventilated and, you know, housing with lead paint, right? Um, and so, you know, Getting at those issues, again, this kind of idea of the social determinants of health, this is now sort of starting to enter a little bit more of the lexicon of, of, of medical education. Um, and I think this is also um, kind of, this is important, but also I think what where this needs to go, this conversation needs to go in terms of structural competency is also this kind of what um, George is talking about with accompaniment. Um, so this notion of not just understanding the conditions that people are living in, but engaging in acts of solidarity with them, right? That are going to actually get at um, not just like referring someone to some services because you know that they're living in some particular conditions, but is there a way in which we can actually change that, that the structure that's impacting your health and that's bringing you into this hospital maybe consistently over and over again with the same problem? Um, and that's where I think inherently the conversation needs to move towards solidarity and activism that brings together the physician and the patient. Is it also true that black women professionals also get less attentiveness to their health care so that we shouldn't stereotype it as only no, formerly uneducated, lower-income black people with lead in their house. It's Serena That's Williams. It's mm -hmm. it's ever it's mm -hmm. not it, that was um, that was independent of class. class. Right. right. Yeah. So I think we're we're running out of time. Oh. So we'll we'll give we um, the last that close to the end. Okay. I have been I have been okay. told. Well, let so me with the last <laughs> word we have George. Okay. So. <laughs> There's a blue song by Sonny Boy Williamson that goes, don't start me talking, I'll tell you everything I know. So giving a, a brief, <laughs> short word is hard. I'll do it this way. Uh, we have difficult days ahead. We have difficult challenges. The uh, professionals need to be changed. The medical textbooks need to be changed. The general social relations of health need to be changed. Uh, there are things need to be done on, on every front. And sometimes we feel that's uh, too daunting and we can't have a simple formula about how you can solve that. But actually, there are two rules that always apply in bringing about social justice. And they're actually also the two rules that Frank Zappa gives for how to play the guitar. So absolutely free. Here are the two rules to bring about social justice. First one is don't stop. And the second one is keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I would like to very much thank um, all, uh, also Carlos Adrian Pine. Um, Deborah Lust Lustig and also CB there on the camera, not on the guitar, um, for putting on this event. Um, and I would also very much like to think, thank both the other participants out there and three very active and distinguished and engaging panelists. Thank you so much.
for all those great and our distinguished models. We're going to be in there. Before everybody leaves, I wanted to remind you that our um, our next uh, our next panel is called A Gaze from the South, Latin America's Struggle for Health Justice. Um, we have a fantastic panel, Dr. Jaime Grail, who's also giving 